Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar with Dr. Beck A. Taylor, our president of Whitworth University. We're really glad that he is here with us today and that you're with us today. I know we have uh, a couple of you who are still joining the webinar. Thanks for your patience as we work out some technical difficulties. But we want to make sure that you get the most out of this webinar. We don't want this to be a lecture by any means. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what questions you have. We want to answer those questions. So I'm going to teach you ways that you can interact with uh, Beck Taylor on Zoom. There's three different functions that we will have. On your screen, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat, a raise your hand, and a Q&A function. So let's practice these right now. In the chat function, would you please type your first and last name as well as where you are from, your hometown. We want to know where you guys are coming from today. Excellent. Okay, looks like we have people from Sherwood, Oregon, Washington, Santa Barbara, Bonnie Lake, Wow, they're coming in so fast, faster than I can read. Eagle, Idaho, more California, more Oregon. Excellent. Well, it looks like we have people from all over here today with us, Beck and Greg. Um, excellent. Wonderful. All right, now let's practice the raise your hand function. We know there are both students and parents on this webinar today. So raise your hand if you are a student, whether you're a current high school senior, a transfer student, or perhaps a junior or younger raise those hands okay great looks like we have about 20 out of the 45 participants are students now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, lower your hands and next up if you are a parent or if you are a parent listening with your student on this webinar go ahead and raise your hand where are our parents and guardians awesome excellent looks like we have about 22, 23 parents on this call as well. Um, and lastly is our Q&A function. This is probably going to be the most useful tool for you to make sure that your questions are getting answered either um, by our admission staff typed out answer or live by our president, Beth Taylor. So anytime you have questions throughout this next hour, feel free to type them in the Q&A function and we will do our best to respond to you. If we run out of time and we don't get to your question, please know we tried our best, but you can submit your questions to admissions at whitworth.edu. We want to make sure that they are answered. Greg, can you hear us okay? Yes, I'm I am back in business. Awesome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, have fun. I'll see you guys in a little bit. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Greg Orwig, the Vice President for Admissions and Financial Aid here at Whitworth. And it is my pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Beck A. Taylor, who is just winding up his 10th year as president at Whitworth. Uh, the a year is going a little bit differently than he or any of us imagined it might be, but in some really cool ways, the best part of our community is still being showing up every day as faculty and students engage, as staff engage with our students in really cool ways. And uh, students are continuing to get a fabulous education of mind and heart. Beck is an economist uh, by training. He was an econ professor before becoming um, an administrator and eventually a president. And he may put on his econ professor hat a little bit today as he answers some of your questions. Um, he and his wife love our students, frequently invite students into their home. Uh, they, sh they show up all the time at athletic events and concerts and other student activities as sort of our biggest, um, our students' biggest supporters. And Beck also loves the Whitworth mission, the way Whitworth lifts up rigorous, open academic inquiry and the integration of Christian faith and learning in complementary rather than competing ways. So you're in for a treat this afternoon and I'll hand it off to Beck to share a little bit and then we hope to leave quite a bit of time to answer questions that you share with us. Take yeah, it away. Th Beck. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, and thanks to Quincy and Laura who are also with us and can help us answer your questions uh, toward the end. As Quincy said, the primary purpose of this forum is really to answer some of your questions. And so I hope that you'll be thinking of those and uh, in submitting those, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. I know some of you have visited campus before, and so if you have, uh, welcome back to the Whitworth experience. But for those of you who haven't been on our campus, uh, I can assure you it's a beautiful one. 
it's even more beautiful when our fantastic students and faculty and staff are, are on campus. Um, I want to just say thank you, first of all, and really kudos to you for taking the time to explore Whitworth virtually. Um, I'm really happy that we're together today via Zoom. Uh, I know you students have heard of yourselves described as Generation Z. You've heard this before. Uh, who knew that it meant that it was Generation Zoom or Zoomers? So you all are the Zoomer generation, at least for the next few weeks. Um, as Greg said, I flat out love our students and I would love for you to become a part of the Whitworth family. I'll just say that here at the outset. Uh, we're grateful that you're taking a look at Whitworth. We would love for you to be a part of our community. I know that for all of us, this is not the way we envision the process going. Uh, your search for the right college or university is not meant to happen via Zoom. And we wish that you could be on our campus and meet more of our awesome people. And perhaps, God willing, uh, for some of you later this spring or summer, you'll have the opportunity to do that if restrictions are lifted. So stay tuned for that. If you're a grad graduating senior, and I'm sure many of you are, um, this is not the way we wanted your high school career to end. And I'm sorry for that. Uh, you've worked so hard to this point. And I know so many of you have champions like your parents or family members or teachers, and mentors and others who have invested in your lives thus far. And they wish that you are having a, a better end to your high school career as well. Like you, I am frustrated and I'm impatient for things to get back to something that looks like normal. Um, but I wanna say that as someone who believes firmly that a loving and all powerful God has a real plan for my life and a real plan for your life, um, I do take hope in the confidence that God is shaping and reshaping me and shaping and reshaping you and our communities, even in the midst, especially in the midst of these uncertain and trying times. Like you, I have good days and I have bad days, but on my good days, I remember that God loves me and that he loves you and that God wants the best for all of us. Um, our ultimate hope is to put our faith and trust in God. And so I hope that that's an encouragement for you uh, today. First, here are just a few things that I want you to know as you finalize your college plans for next year. First, Whitworth will start classes one way or another in the fall. If we have to adjust operations temporarily to ensure the health of our community, we will. But we are already planning for the arrival of our new first year students, freshmen and transfer students in September. We're doing a good job planning now to ensure that no matter what changing circumstances might be in the fall, that we are ready for anything. And I can assure you that your health and your well being are our biggest priorities. And we're making plans now to ensure that our campus can operate and function in the fall so that you can get started with your college journey with as few uh, disruptions as possible. I also want to assure you that Whitworth is in very strong financial shape, financial position. This is important because many colleges and universities today are facing some financial challenges with the closing and shuttering of campuses. Uh, the last two years have brought us record enrollments. We have a healthy endowment and financial reserves and even new buildings and new programs that are being added even now. It's a great time to be a Whitworth student, to start your Whitworth journey and to get an education of mind and heart here at Whitworth. Um, I'm glad to say that our amazing professors are showcasing their commitment to students this spring by creating digital learning environments and communities that really do match the quality of our classroom learning. I'm so proud of our faculty members. They're doing a fantastic job. My daughter, Lauren, is actually a graduating senior here at Whitworth. She's finishing up her last three weeks of classes um, here. And like so many of you, her last weeks as a student at Whitworth aren't going exactly as planned. Uh, Lauren is a pre-med double major in biophysics and chemistry. And Lauren tells me that she certainly prefers the face-to-face -face learning that she's become accustomed to at Whitworth, but she also brags to me all the time about the amazing ways her faculty members, her professors, 
have adapted their classes to deliver learning and content online. Again, it's not her favorite, but she assures me that all of her classes are going smoothly and that they're just as tough and just as demanding as usual, and importantly, that she's feeling the support from her faculty mentors. Also, I want you to know that our student life staff are doing more, not less, to support our students. We only currently have about 40 students living on campus right now. These are students who are place bound and really had no other place to go. But for all of our students, including those that are still on campus, our career services and health and counseling support services, our advising, even our student clubs and organizations are coming together to create community, even virtually, um, and to support all of our students. I think that the re reasons record numbers of students have chosen Whitworth the past two years is the same reason why you should choose Whitworth. It's because of our dedication to our students. Whitworth truly puts students at the center of the university. It's one of the many reasons why US News ranked Whitworth this year as the number one university in the West for the quality of our undergraduate teaching. That's something that we take a lot of pride in and something that you should be interested in as well. So I encourage you to keep plugging into these online opportunities to learn more about Whitworth and to connect with members of our community. You're doing exactly the right thing right now. It's not the same as visiting in person, but I have no doubt that it can help you in the discernment process. So with all of the uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus and the economy, I realize that it's probably pretty easy to get paralyzed uh, to consider maybe even putting off plans to attend college. And I understand that, but as a former economics professor, as Greg said, let me give you just a few things to think about as you make this decision. First, the cost of doing most things, including going to college, go up every year. So delaying the start of college, something you've worked so hard for, delaying that even a year uh, will cause the cost of your degree to go up. There's no doubt about that. Also deferring your college uh, delays when you can enter the workforce and actually start that career that you're coming to college in part to prepare for. The average salary for a college graduate today is about $51,000. So you could be missing out on the opportunity to potentially earn that amount of money in exchange for whatever you decide to do, maybe in a down economy in the coming year, assuming that you're able to find a job. In an economic downturn, it's typically the, the best time to go to school and to prepare for that recovery, which we all know will come. So do it now and not later. And last, perhaps most importantly, students who enter college directly after high school, this is our experience at Whitworth for sure, but across all of higher education, students who enter college directly out of high school finish their degrees uh, and graduate on time at higher rates than students who take a break between high school and college. For all kinds of reasons, it's just harder for students who step out of the educational process to find their way back in and there can be huge economic and social and other costs of not completing your degree. So I realize there may be good reasons for a student to defer for a semester or even a year, and that's certainly an option for you here at Whitworth, but I really would encourage you to talk with your admissions counselor carefully before making that decision. Finally, as Greg alluded to, I'm finishing my 10th year as Whitworth's president and, as I like to say, pirate in chief. Um, I absolutely love this place. My family and I live on campus. We have a home that's right here on campus. And so we get to live with students and walk this educational journey with our students. As I mentioned, my daughter is a student. There are many reasons why I think that Whitworth is a great place for you to choose for college. So let me just give you three very quick reasons why I think Whitworth is a special place. First, Whitworth is first and foremost, a great academic community. Our faculty members could be teaching anywhere in the world. And they've chosen Whitworth in part because it's a place that embraces both academic preparation and a relational commitment to our community and to mentoring our students. As I said, first and foremost, Whitworth is great academically. We have the best students, the best programs, and even the best facilities 
to really contribute to your academic journey here. We have faculty members who excel in their fields of study and often include students in their research and writing. Students are really our best signal of academic quality and our students consistently are recognized for their academic achievement. Just in the past couple of years, we've been recognized, Whitworth's been recognized as a top producer of Fulbright scholars among our students. We've had a Rhodes Scholar finalist. Just this year, we had three Goldwater Scholars. These are very prestigious scholarships in, in the STEM disciplines. Our students uh, consistently win national championships in Ethics Bowl and in debate and other student competitions. Our business students win seed money uh, in financing for their startup organizations. Uh, our students receive top medical law and graduate school placements. And as I mentioned, students present and publish research often. And nearly half of our students study away, study off of campus, either abroad or somewhere else in the United States, sometime during their experience here at Whitworth. So our students really are the best indicators of academic success, and, and they really do tell a wonderful story. And lastly, family members, parents for sure, I know you're interested in this, 96% of our graduates are employed or are in graduate school nine months after graduation. That's really important to our graduates succeed in the labor market. And that's important uh, for a return on investment. The second thing I wanna mention is that Whitworth truly embraces the value of integrating Christian faith with this rigorous and open intellectually uh, uh, vital uh, experience uh, education that I've described. We know that students are eager to explore issues of faith and meaning in their life. Students, as you go to college, these are the best years for you to ask questions about yourself and about your neighbor and about the world around you and to be discerning the ways that God might be summoning you into that world. Our faculty, each of whom is a faithful Christian, walk their students through their disciplines with a concern for ethics and a consideration for others and perspectives that are grounded in the biblical worldview and narrative. So faith and learning are integrated in the classroom, no matter the discipline. If you're a, thinking about being a teacher or a scientist or a business person, uh, regardless of what you're thinking about doing in the, in the world, a medical doctor, a psychologist, your faculty members will be thinking with you about how God might be calling you into those disciplines. And then the last thing I want to mention is really Whitworth's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Whitworth is an open and a welcoming place for all students, especially all students regardless of your faith journey. Um, we know that students choose Whitworth for many reasons other than it's the Christian university that I've just described. Um, I truly want Whitworth to be the best Christian university for the non-Christian student. We should be more and not less welcoming to all students because of our faith commitments. Um, one recognition or one statistic that may be of interest to you is that in our uh, freshman class that came to us this last fall, 50% of that new class were from our students of color, our first generation college students, or our international students. And so that gives you a sense of the diversity of the place. And we really think that that diversity is, is a real strength of a Whitworth education and will really contribute to uh, your Whitworth um, experience here. So those are just three reasons among many that I could mention today that caused me to be excited about Whitworth, why I've spent the better part of my professional career here and why I'm so excited about the future. I'll end the way I started. We want you to be a pirate. And so we hope that these virtual visits allow you the opportunity to learn more about our community and our programs and our people. And uh, really with the time left, we wanna answer your questions. And so I'll turn it back over to you, Quincy. Actually, I'm gonna jump in. Okay, great. Back. And uh, we've got several questions that are all around the same theme of what kind of contingency plans are we working on if the, um, if we're not able to start classes in the fall uh, the way we would normally do yeah. it in the fall. Yeah, you bet. 
Let me start by just saying again, our commitment to your health and safety. That is our number one commitment. And so uh, we are uh, already uh, tasking ourselves with thinking about our healthcare services and our counseling services, the ways, uh, the opportunities we have to provide housing for students that uh, contribute to their well being. Uh, we are expecting, we are expecting to be up and operational this fall, but our country is still going to be dealing with cases of COVID 19. The good news is that other than those of you students who may be immune compromised or may have other underlying health conditions, the COVID-19 virus um, doesn't appear to affect your age group quite like it does older people like Greg and me. And so um, that gives us some uh, uh, ability to think about housing students in ways, again, with proper social distancing and other kinds of things that can contribute to your well-being. So just know that your health and well-being is our number one, um, our number one priority. But when it comes to academics, we are going to be ready for anything in the fall. Again, we're expecting to be up and running. We are expecting to be uh, hosting classes in person. Uh, we are expecting that some social distancing rules may still be in place and we need to heed those. Um, but we're gonna develop all of our courses in the fall in what we call a hybrid format. And what I mean by that is they're going to be being offered in person, but if a student needs to check out for seven days or 14 days, for quarantine or for isolation, that student can continue their academic journey online. And so that's gonna be really seamless. That transition is gonna be seamless. And so we're thinking about um, how to build out all of our courses to provide that online support um, as well. We're also thinking about calendaring. As I said, we're gonna start in the fall no matter what, but we have some flexibility in the academic calendar that will allow us, should we need to, to start and stop for periods of time. And so we'll certainly be looking at those opportunities as well. So we're doing all the best thinking we can right now to ensure that you can start your college journey on time and that we can get through the first semester or the first two semesters in ways that really don't put you back at all should we have to worry about quarantining or isolating students. Again, we're gonna have all the, the, the resources in place to allow for your college journey to start, hopefully in a way that's undisturbed. Thanks, Beck. We have maybe a little more fun question here. What are some of your favorite student success stories? Yeah, so here's, a, here's one that comes to mind. Um, so there are, there are a lot of schools right now who are announcing that they are going test optional. That is that they're not going to require either the SAT or the ACT um, to uh, gain college admission. Whitworth actually became test optional 13 years ago. And we did it for a lot of reasons other than simply the uh, unavailability of taking the ACT and SAT during the COVID-19 crisis. We know that students can demonstrate competency and achievement and aptitude in many ways beyond simply the standardized test. So the story I have for you is a, an education student that wanted to come to Whitworth now several years ago. And um, she just wasn't a very good standardized test taker. I'm actually not a very good standardized test taker myself. And so I could certainly relate. And so she depended upon uh, the test optional approach to gain admission to Whitworth, it turned out that she was a stellar student. And here's my favorite part of the story. It turns out that she had had an undiagnosed learning disability that was part of the cause, part of the reason why she didn't always perform as well as she wanted to on standardized tests. And so she was actually diagnosed in our learning accommodations area here at Whitworth uh, with that learning disability. As I mentioned, she was a School of Education student. And so as she learned more about educational psychology and students who bring learning differences to the classroom, she decided to change her focus of study to really supporting those students with learning differences. And so she ended up graduating from our School of Education with honors and started a career in educational psychology, really helping students to navigate the educational system despite some of the learning differences that they bring to bear. And so 
I love that story because it shows the tenacity of this particular student. It shows the way that our School of Education surrounded the student with new resources and really about how her own life journey impacted the way she saw her calling in the world. And so that's one of my, that's one of my favorite stories that comes to mind today. Yeah, great. Um, one student asked, what will new student orientation look like? In the yeah. Fall? Well, we're expecting and we're planning for new student orientation to look very much like it might look otherwise. Um, September 5th is the date, uh, I believe, if I'm not incorrect, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but that most of our first year students will be That's moving right. in. Is that right, Greg, September 5th? Yes. Yeah, September yeah, 5th. I thought I had that date in my mind. Um, we're expecting that families and students will arrive on September 5th. Um, we may need to be paying attention to some social distancing guidelines that are in place at that time, and we certainly will be doing that. But we want to orient students in all the fun and exciting ways to your college experience uh, as we do normally. And so that will consist of opportunities to get to know each other, to get to know your hallmates and your roommates, to understand Whitworth and some of its traditions and culture, um, and really to have fun the first few days of your college career. Uh, and then classes will begin and the fun will continue, but in a different way. So we are um, expecting orientation to happen as scheduled, but if we need to adjust that or to modify that in some ways, please know that we're willing to do that. And we certainly will help you to orient to your new home here at Whitworth. All right, we have a question about how, what was our process for suspending our study abroad programs or bringing home students who were on exchanges this spring? Yeah, so like everyone, we were uh, modifying and adapting to a very quickly changing situation. In fact, uh, Julie, my wife and I were just talking about had we known where we were going to end up, it would have made decision making perhaps a little bit easier but we scrutinized and frankly, we agonized over decisions that really impacted our students' um, educational experiences, particularly those that were overseas. Um, when, uh, as I mentioned before, we put all of our faith in the advice that we were getting from our health authorities and from our um, elected representatives. And, um, and as we were listening to that guidance, it became clear to us at a point that we needed to repatriate our students back to the US, either because we were afraid they would not be able to return if things in their host countries got bad enough and they would be stuck, but also because we were most confident that those students could be best served if they were back home uh, in an environment that, that had more controls. Of course, our students were very disappointed to be called back to the US, who wouldn't be? But I've spoken to many of those students. I've actually met via Zoom with many of those students. And they were very grateful for the quick response and the support that Whitworth was able to provide its students who were studying abroad. And, and fortunately, I, I can say this. Um, to date, we have had no confirmed cases of the COVID-19 virus among any of our students, our faculty, or our staff. And of course, we give uh, God great praise and thanks for that. But in part, that's due to some of the decision making we were able to, to make on the fly to get our students home and into safer environments. All right, another fun question here, Beck. What is your favorite Whitworth tradition? Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. So I love athletics. And as, as uh, Greg knows, I love to cheer on our students who are doing really anything athletics, uh, singing in the choir, performing in theater, uh, 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 doing a debate. I love to support our students in those environments, but there's nothing like a Whitworth sporting event where students are together and the community's together uh, rooting on the Pirates. But I actually think my favorite, um, I'll pick two because I have so many, but I'll pick two. The first is what we call, going back to orientation, the first is what we call the crossover ceremony. This happens the very same day that you move into your residence halls, most of you. Your family members are there, of course. These are your champions, the people who have gotten you to this point. Uh, maybe you have siblings and friends who are with you. And uh, we formally accept you at this crossover ceremony into the Whitworth community. And as part of that, you cross under 
a pine cone arch. And if you've been to our campus, you know that the Ponderosa pine is ubiquitous on our campus and beautiful. And so this pine cone arch kind of represents your journey, your entrance into the Whitworth family and community. And so on one side of the arch, uh, you are who you are. You're the pre-Whitworth you. But as you cross under the arch, you're welcomed into the Whitworth community. You become a Whitworthian for life. And you're welcomed on that side by our current students and our faculty and our staff and our administrators who welcome you gladly. Four years later, for most students, um, you have the opportunity to cross back under that arch, symbolizing your re-entry into the world um, and as someone who wants to uh, promote the mission of Whitworth, which is to honor God, follow Christ, and serve humanity, regardless of how uh, you're being summoned into the world professionally. So that's my first um, one that I'll mention. My second is uh, an event that happens at graduation. It actually happens on Friday night before our Sunday commencement. We call it our senior communion and commissioning service. It's the last time that our seniors have to worship together. And uh, we share stories, uh, we celebrate together, we acknowledge God's blessings on the graduating class, and we share in the Lord's Supper together, and we commission formally our students to go into the world uh, to do great things. Um, there's never a dry eye, uh, as Greg knows, in that ceremony. And so those are two of my favorite traditions at Whitworth. Yeah, me too. Nailed them. Uh, so I have a question here about whether we have seen students canceling their admission or their commitment to Whitworth and what the percentage has been. And I probably have more on top of those numbers than Beck is. So yeah. I'll jump in and just share that we've actually seen fewer students cancel um, their commitments or deposits to Whitworth this year than we have in the prior two years. Um, it's a number we watched pretty carefully. And when we compare the number, you know, schools like Whitworth admit um, relatively large number of students in order to enroll the numbers that um, we're aiming for in the fall. And this time of year, we start to hear from more and more students who've made their decision and let us know that they're planning to go to another school. And we have about 110 fewer students who have withdrawn their application and told us they're planning to go somewhere else at this point this year compared to this same date last year. So we take that as pretty encouraging and a continuation of the really strong student enrollment interest we've seen for several years at Whitworth. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Yeah, we're very encouraged by that. And really until a couple of weeks ago, um, I, you know, our class was tracking actually uh, really a little bit ahead of where we, were, where we were really forecasting and wanting. Things have slowed down, understandably, the last couple of weeks. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, we've extended our, our deposit deadline until June 1. We know families need a little bit extra time to make decisions, and we certainly hope that you'll make a decision soon, but you have that, that period of time if you need it. Uh, we have a question about whether we know anything yet about fall sports and whether the fall sports season is going to happen as planned and scheduled. Yeah, uh, great question. And in fact, this morning, I spent two and a half hours on a Zoom call. That's all we do these days is Zoom calls um, with the other presidents of the Northwest Conference. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Whitworth Pirates play in the very competitive Northwest Conference. It's a NCAA Division Three conference. And the other eight presidents and I got together on a Zoom call today to talk exactly about uh, some of our expectations and planning for the fall. And I think I can speak for all um, uh, eight of my colleagues and certainly myself when I say we are planning for a competitive sports year next year. Um, we know that things might have to look a little bit different from time to time, but uh, we want our student athletes to have a great experience. And so uh, respecting all of the public health advice and rules and other things that might be in place in the fall, we want to create the best environment possible for our student athletes um, to compete. There might be some changes here or there. Um, there might be a little bit less regional play. In other words, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, national play. If a state is going through a particularly difficult time with COVID-19 in the fall, we probably don't want to send our student athletes to play in that state. So that could impact a little bit of our travel seasons. 
Um, but uh, regionally, as you know, the Northwest has done a great job uh, of managing the COVID-19 spread. And I anticipate that that will continue. So we're not expecting too much disruption, if any, in our Northwest Conference competitive seasons. And so the other thing we're expecting is that um, as the academic year progresses, our hope is that things get a little bit, even a little bit better uh, in terms of the virus. Perhaps more therapeutics are discovered. Our testing certainly is gonna be much better by the fall, even before move-in, I expect. And uh, hopefully uh, sometime early spring, we'll have a vaccine. And so all of those things should contribute to uh, hopefully a fairly normal um, athletic experience for our student athletes. So a question about how much Jan term costs and I can answer that. It's $325 for the coming year, which is the cheapest three to five credits you could get anywhere. Right. But I wonder, Beck, if you could uh, share a bit about what, um, what a great benefit uh, or value Jan term and May term are no matter what. Oh my gosh. Of... It's one of my favorite parts about the Whitworth academic calendar. First of all, the price is awesome. Uh, you, basically you pay no tuition uh, for Jan term. Uh, there is a, a small a fee of $325, um, but almost all of our students participate in Jan term and many of them use Jan term as that opportunity to study away from campus, as I mentioned earlier. Um, my own daughter, I'll just say what Lauren did. My own daughter uh, has done some amazing things during Jan term. She went to Sri Lanka uh, as part of a Jan term experience and got an amazing cross-cultural experience there. She spent another Jan term on the Mercy ship uh, off the coast of Cameroon, Africa. Um, and really enjoyed that experience. As I mentioned, she's pre-med, and so that was uh, a particularly useful experience for her. And then she spent a GN term doing research in our crystallography center, in our chemistry crystallography center, and actually presented a paper at the American Chemical Society in Boston uh, during uh, her GN term. Um, so GN terms are used for these really cool enrichment experiences, three and a half weeks long, great opportunities to travel. Um, uh, freshmen typically, other than honor students, freshmen typically take courses on campus during Jan term, but your sophomore year, junior year, senior year, uh, you can certainly travel and those opportunities are, are quite um, abundant. Um, May term can be substituted for Jan term. So if, for example, if you're a student athlete and you're competing during the winter months, uh, May term may, may be a better option for you, um, and those same benefits accrue for May term students. Well, I might just jump in and point out that because Whitworth offers Jan term and May term, it, it gives us some options and flexibility should we need to, if we have to get a later start or adjust our academic calendar at the beginning of the school year because of coronavirus, Jan term and May term gives us some uh, greater flexibility for helping um, students uh, recover those credits that they may may have lost. So there's that extra benefit. Well, I mean, one way to put, put it as well, Greg, I mean, just in terms of value is we, you know, most students are taking three, four credits and in Jan term, uh, if you multiply that by four Jan terms, you know, you're basically getting a semester of credit, uh, you know, for free, no tuition. Um, so that's another real value. Which is one reason why such a high, high percentage of our students finish in four years. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions here, Beck. Um, what are some of your favorite places to hang out or visit in the Spokane area? Oh, that's great question. <laughs> we love Spokane. And one of my favorite things to watch, uh, quite a few of our Whitworth uh, graduates, even if they come here from other parts of the country, they find jobs here in the Spokane area. Eastern Washington is a growing and very economically uh, vibrant area. And so many of our alumni uh, stay uh, right here in the Spokane area. I love the way our recent graduates um, learn even more about how wonderful um, Eastern Washington is and Spokane in particular. Some of my favorite things to do is go down to the river. Um, the riverfront is an amazing place to just spend a beautiful afternoon and uh, read a book or go shopping. Uh, we have amazing restaurants uh, here in town as well. Uh, we have a lot of really cool niche bookstores and coffee shops and things like that that I often see students frequenting. Um, the outdoors is a big thing here. And so if you love the outdoors, 
Uh, the mountains are nearby and the winter skiing is very close by and a lot of students uh, go skiing. In fact, Jan term, one Jan term class is skiing and snowboarding. And so if you're, uh, if you've never done that, you want to learn how to do it, Jan term would be a, a great opportunity to do that. So that's some of the things we enjoy doing, uh, getting on the bike, uh, heading over to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, my daughter, Lauren, was also a leader in our outdoor rec program. And every weekend, we have at least one, often two, uh, guided uh, mountaineering or hiking or camping tours that are leaving campus for the weekend. Very safe, guided by expertly trained uh, professionals. And so a lot of students take care, uh, take advantage of our outdoor rec program as well. We have a few Hawaiian uh, students and parents on the Zoom today. And Aloha, good to see you. <laughs> So we got a question, what is the Hawaiian community uh, like on campus and in Spokane? The Hawaiian Ohana here in, uh, in Whitworth in Spokane is rich and deep. Um, we have uh, just a wonderful Hawaiian cohort of students growing, in fact, Greg. I think over the last six or seven years, our number of Hawaiian students has probably doubled. If, if, I hope that's not an exaggeration, but I think- Tripled, actually. Tri well, it was, a, it was an underestimate, it's triple. We've had a long uh, uh, relationship with uh, students in Hawaii. Uh, this isn't new, but we've put particular emphasis on it the last decade or so, and we're really seeing our Hawaiian students uh, not only come to Whitworth in record numbers, but really flourish. Um, one of the really sad parts about the spring to me was we were celebrating our 50th Hawaiian luau uh, our luau at Whitworth is a huge event. All of our students and many community members come and great food and dancing. Even I do uh, a Hawaiian hula dance. Um, I'm sure people don't come to watch that, but, but uh, it's fun. Greg actually does it too. And uh, we had to cancel that event. So next fall, uh, if you were to come to Whitworth, you would get to experience our 50th annual luau, which I know is going to be uh, a huge event. So the, the Whitworth uh, Hawaiian Club is very active on campus and um, so the Hawaiian community here is strong and uh, we're very proud of it. Yeah, many of the Whitworth alums uh, who came to Whitworth and then stuck around in the community have, uh, they host a welcome potluck at the beginning of the year where they connect with all of our new and returning Hawaiian students and become uh, uncles and aunties to uh, our Hawaiian students. And it's a really cool thing to watch. Um, what are some of the best places to study on campus, Beck? Well, you know, um, I don't do a lot of studying any longer, uh, but I will tell you what students tell me. And that is uh, the library is always in demand. Uh, we have a wonderfully, uh, uh, a wonderful facility in our library and students pick their favorite cubby hole or their favorite corner or their favorite nook and uh, often spend hours in our library. Our Mind and Hearth coffee shop is another favorite place for people to study. Um, uh, on a beautiful spring day, I wish you could see what it looks like today in Spokane, but it is absolutely gorgeous. We would have normally students out on blankets in our campus loop, our quad, uh, studying. And then we have just a ton of coffee houses uh, independent coffee houses around campus that a lot of students frequent to study. So it's whatever floats your boat. If, you, if you're more in a social mood to study, then one of the coffee houses or doing something outside makes more sense. But during final exams or midterms, uh, most students have their head down and are in our library or other quiet places around campus. Yeah, wherever there are two trees close enough on a nice day like today, there'll be a lot of hammocks out yes, too. Yes, you bet. Yeah. Um, so question here, how many work study programs are available to students? And I know that we have about a thousand part-time on-campus student jobs. Not Just all of them. Just think about that for a moment. A thousand of our students are working for the university. That's an amazing number. And then we have some state work study positions that can be uh, off-campus where students can get experience and earn income. And uh, this is often a question that families have, and we certainly understand the question. Um, we will communicate with families during the summer 
about the process for um, getting your materials ready to apply for those on-campus jobs. And we open the application process on the first day of move-in weekend, so on September 5th this coming year, so that all the students are on the same playing field in terms of being able to compete and apply for those jobs. So if you're coming from further away, you're not at a disadvantage uh, with local students. And my advice is if you are jump on the process right away so you don't wait till mid-October before you start applying and you apply to you know half a dozen jobs rather than putting all your eggs in one basket, it's very rare that a student isn't able to get a, a campus job. And we watch pretty closely um, to make sure that uh, student employment doesn't get in the way of students being successful in the classroom. And research shows actually that students who work 10 to 15 hours or less on campus do as well or better academically than students who don't work. Yeah, let me, let me just say a couple of things too in my experience. Um, Julie and I host a life group. It's a small Bible study um, each fall. And we always choose first year students to be in our life group. And so there are 12 students each fall in our, in our little Bible study. And um, invariably we have a, a first year student, a freshman who decided maybe not to work on campus their first year or to get a student job. But then they decide maybe halfway through their first semester, oh, maybe I should do that. Or maybe going into the spring term, they wanna do that. And our experience is that students who change their mind, they may have to be a little bit more patient and, and apply a little bit more, uh, but they're ultimately able to get placed into a student job, which is great. And then I know that families and students often see student employment as a way to help pay the bills. And, and absolutely, it's a great way to do that. But don't forget about the professional development opportunities that are in student employment as well. You're not gonna be doing things that, that um, that, that don't contribute to your resume of skills. No matter where you work on campus, you're gonna be under the supervision of somebody who cares for you and wants to mentor you. You're gonna be learning new skills. You're gonna be learning responsibility and you're gonna be developing a resume, which is exactly what you should be doing uh, in college. So don't think of it just as a way to pay tuition, but also as a great professional development opportunity. Okay, we have a parent who shares that her son has narrowed it down to two colleges. Both have offered similar financial aid. One is in this uh, family's hometown, okay. 10 minutes away from where they live, and the other is seven hours away. So as a family, they're trying to decide whether they should um, keep them close to home during this era of so much uncertainty. Do you have any thoughts, suggestions, advice yeah. about how families can weigh those things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would say is you're thinking ex about exactly the right things. This is not an unreasonable thing to be thinking about. Um, seven hours though, you know, if you were thinking about sending your child across the country uh, this fall, given some of the uncertainties, um, I might have a little bit more hesitation as a, as a parent myself who sent two kids off to college, one across the country. Um, but seven hours is frankly probably close enough that no matter what happens or what kind of flexibility we need to show in the fall, that um, you're going to be able to attend to your, your students' needs. Um, our students are so generous, by the way, too, even during breaks. Um, our students are providing carpools and rides and other kinds of things uh, to each other to get back home, even for breaks and things like that. So seven hours seems like a lot, but honestly, um, it's not that far if, if we need to be flexible and your student needs to have that flexibility. Um, and then uh, if the college is in your backyard, uh, this may be more of a concern for your student. If your student was anything like me, I wanted to get out of Dodge uh, and have a little bit more of an independent experience. Here's what I say to students who maybe are questioning whether or not they want to go to school close to home. Um, I've, I've mentioned Lauren maybe too many times already today. Uh, but she moved across the street. I mean, I live on campus, and so you can see her residence hall from my front door. And she would tell you that she had a very independent college experience. Um, we did not see each other unless we really planned on it. Occasionally, we ran into each other on campus. But it's not as if um, she felt like she was literally going to school in her backyard. I know of a lot of other um, college students at Whitworth whose parents live in Spokane and they report the same thing. Uh, it's great to have mom and, door, mom and dad or, or home close by if needed, 
but they still get to experience that independent living and that independent college experience. And so those are, that's a great question to be asking, but seven hours or back, uh, you know, next door, to me, there probably aren't as many trade-offs there as you might even think. And so we have a few questions clustered around spiritual life at Whitworth and a couple deal with, is there, is chapel required? Is there a theology class that's required for students to graduate? Yeah, so, um, so Whitworth does take a spiritual formation and spiritual life very seriously. As a Christian university, we, we want to expose students to the way Christians view the world. Um, we're not shy uh, about that at all. At the same time, we live into our commitments to welcome all students. Um, part of that uh, commitment to welcome all students is that we do not require students to attend chapel. Uh, but I want you to know chapel is standing room. I mean, uh, our students absolutely love to attend chapel, but it's not something that's forced on you or that you're required to attend. Um, there are many other opportunities to plug into spiritual life programs on campus too. We have programs almost every evening. Uh, we have these small groups or life groups, as I mentioned before. Um, and of course, you're in a community that elevates um, spiritual life. And so you're going you're gonna to have those opportunities if you want uh, to grow spiritually. Um, students are required to take one biblical literature class. That's part of their, uh, your shared curriculum or general education requirement. Um, many students decide to take more than that. Uh, many of our students love our theology department and take many courses in our theology department, but you do have that one class in biblical literature that's required. But then again, also remember that uh, faith and learning are integrated uh, throughout your Whitworth experience in all classes. And there are well over a dozen different course options that students can choose from to satisfy that uh, biblical literacy requirement. Right. And they're taught as academic subjects. It's That's not right. a kind of material that where you're being asked to believe something that you don't, you don't believe. Right. So another more uh, granular question specifically about the worship, um, and what worship nights look like on Tuesday and Thursday with oh. Hosanna and uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have, um, we basically have three large group worshiping opportunities every week, really four. Um, chapel happens two times a week, so, so three, one of them happens twice a week. But chapel is on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 to 11.30. And here's what's great about chapel. Everything's canceled on class during chapel. No meetings, no classes, um, and so you're not missing anything to get to go to chapel. And our chapel on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, on Tuesdays, um, we generally hear, we, we always praise uh, the Lord and worship. We have a great student praise team that leads us through worship. And on Tuesdays, one of our campus ministers generally preaches a 10 minute, 12 minute homily on a book that we're actually going through at the time. This spring, for example, even now, even during COVID days, uh, we have virtual worship and we're going through the book of Deuteronomy. On Thursdays in chapel, we also worship, um, we sing together, we generally have a testimony or two, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, communion every Thursday. So that's chapel. Then on Tuesday nights, we have something called Hosanna. It's a long-standing Whitworth tradition. It starts at 9.45 p.m. in our chapel, and it's a completely contemplative, student-led worship experience, and it is fantastic. Hundreds of students come, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to connect and to worship. Um, and then on Wednesday nights, we have something called Awake, and it begins at 9.30 p.m. And Awake is just another ministry that opens its doors to students of uh, all different experiences and faith traditions. I spoke uh, this semester at Awake and got to meet with those students, and they generally have lots of questions about faith. They're generally exploring in some ways. And so those are our three big format, if you will, kind of worship, teaching, um, spiritual life opportunities. But I know that different dorms, different halls uh, have their own worshiping experiences. We have small groups all over campus that meet regularly. And then we have life groups, which are students who are going to a faculty or staff member's home uh, for um, a Bible study in, in community. So that's just a general idea of what our spiritual life looks like. And I'm not even mentioning a lot of things that I could. This may be a question on a lot of our um, 
students' minds, but what advice would you give a high school senior trying to make this big decision in the midst of a pandemic? Yeah, <laughs> I wish I had more experience to, to lean on to answer your question. Here's what I would say. Um, this is going to end. Uh, the pandemic is going to end. Um, there's some uncertainty about how we get from here to there, but this will end and we need to be making good decisions today that anticipate what we want to be doing when this pandemic ends. And so I realize that this state of the world we're in is introducing a lot of uncertainty and doubt and anxiety. And that's understandable. I feel those same things. Um, but let's remind each other that um, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, when you graduate with a college degree, um, this is going to be a very interesting experience that you can tell your grandkids about, but our world is going to look very different then. So make the kinds of decisions today that you would make if it weren't for the pandemic. Certainly ask um, schools all the hard questions you've asked me and us today, but choose that college or university that feels like the best fit for you, regardless of kind of what temporary state of the world we find ourselves in today. This is going to end. This is likely going to end very quickly. And you need to be thinking about the future in the same ways you would be thinking about the future if it weren't for the pandemic. That seems like a fabulous note to end on. And it's right on 4.30 on the dot. Great. If you're in the middle of typing and a question, go ahead and submit that. We'll answer that um, off the air, so to speak. But thank you so much, Beck, for, you know, I, we didn't even have to ask you. You uh, kind of offered and left it the chance to connect with our prospective students, which you so often do. I love to do it. I wish I could see all of your faces. I do, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know if Quincy's going to jump back on and maybe share some upcoming uh, virtual interactive visit opportunities that we have, but uh, there she is. So Quincy. Hi, thanks so much, Beck, for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for being here with us today. Um, if you would like some additional information on some webinars, we have a couple of residence hall tours coming up. If you are not quite sure where you want to live, we will be doing some virtual video tours um, for the next couple of weeks, as well as live campus tours, where we will be virtually walking you around our campus, but it will be led by a current tour guide. A couple academic department Q and A's, so keep signing up for webinars. We're so glad you're here. Um, we hope you have an excellent afternoon, and we hope to see you in the fall. Go Pirates! Have a great afternoon, everybody.